Behind the Mask, the podcast. We are the mask. Behind the mask. With Dr. William. We are the genius. <laughs> we are the mask, mask, mask. The Hulk is here today, oh, guys. You know <laughs> I say the we podcast. bring Roxy in to do a live recording or a live a show idea. of that. And then she can just pop in and out for all of the segments. I like it. Yeah, That's I think that would be fun. really fun. She's a different outfit every time. Yeah, well, of course you have to have the costume change. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, guys, we interrupt this broadcast to bring you our winner from our last episode's OG Wheel $250 giveaway. So if you see your name on the screen, then check your DMs because we'll be contacting you soon to get your winnings. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next time on Behind the Mask. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a brand new episode of Behind the Mask, the podcast where you will learn everything you need to know before having plastic surgery. I'm your host, Gabby Allen, here with the one, the only, Dr. William. Hey, Gabby, how are you? I've been better, but we're good. We're here with a little bit more of a brace than I had last time. Yes, but um, we are recovering, and what better place to be than on a... Showers are slippery. Yeah, they're so slippery, and so... Is my hand to a wall sometimes, but hey, that's okay. We learn, we grow, and we learn here on this podcast. And if this is your first time here, you will be educated, you will learn. And Dr. William is a board certified plastic surgeon here in Miami and the originator of the OG method. And so today we are talking to a brand new guest here from Sydney, Australia. This is Candy Stevenson. Hi, Candy. Welcome, How are Candy. You? Hi. Very excited to be here. Oh, we are so happy to have you. Very we excited. are. You look beautiful in the purple. I love the energy, guys. This is Candy. She is a nurse, a massage therapist, and the owner of Australia's first cosmetic recovery home, Care Next Door. Candy. 40 hours. 40 hours. I think we all want to know, how are you awake and functioning right now? I have no idea. <laughs> Me either. Me either. No well, idea. you're doing it really, really well. <laughs> I am convinced. You. I need the regimen. <laughs> so, Candy, how did you come to know about Dr. William and Behind the Mask? Sure. So basically, uh, we had a patient come to our clinic uh, for their lymphatic massaging who had just come over for the OG Faha launch. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was massaging her, talking to her about the garment, and she was explaining to me how wonderful the compression was. And through all of our history through recovery, the biggest problem was the garments. So as soon as I heard that there was a new garment out with better compression in those areas, I had to find out what they were like. So that's when I sent an email. Yeah. Here I am. Well, welcome. I'm really excited to have you here. I mean, it's, it's Thank awesome. You. And your level of expertise, you know, obviously we've been talking before this, is just uh, unparalleled. And I think what you're doing is really, I mean, a leader in not Australia, but the world, really. Oh, thank we you. Do, we don't have what, you, what you're doing to the level that you're doing. And I think that's really exciting today to be able to get into some of those things. Yeah. But can I just ask you a question just before we even go into that? I always like to know what people's story is, what your background. I know you're from Australia, but you're really from New the Zealand. neighboring uh, island. You guys don't always get along, but you do. And just tell us a little bit about your story, your background and how you got to where you did. I'm, I'm sure. just curious. Okay. So basically I moved to Australia when I was 14. Um, I started working in a nursing home in the laundry. And then my mother was one of the nurse supervisors there. Then I started doing my nursing and that was at 16 years old. And then started I started nursing school at 16. 16. Wow. The AIN, so assistant in nursing, and then you go on to you do your enrolled nursing and then your registered nursing. So then I started my own company where we just did post-operative transport. So anyone who was under anesthesia had to be transported home by a responsible adult. Um, and then we got to transport cosmetic patients and that's how we fell into the cosmetic industry. Um, and just over the years of all the patients' experiences, we've developed uh, packages to tailor to their needs because it's a holistic care that we mm-hmm. want to provide and ongoing continuity of care, like personal trainers, food and nutrition, keeping their results. And so with the, how does a lymphatic massage fit in? Because that's different than nursing. So we, our registered nurses are lymphatic massages as well. 
Is that a separate path you have to take to do that? You have to do a separate course. Okay. Yeah. It's about a six-month course. Okay. Yeah. Um, And and my company only has nurses that are registered with the the massages, so we don't have just massage therapists. Um, And we believe that's because we're dealing with wounds and incisions. We want Uh to make sure they're kept clean, and Mm -hmm. um, we're looking for those complications early trying to prevent complications, that sort of thing. Very important. So wound care is, is a part of your training too then? Yes. So when we go and look after them, we do shower garment changes. We clean their incisions. Wow. We give them around two showers. And then the third shower, we like, to, we like them to shower themselves. So we know they can put their garment on. They can put their bedded in on all their incisions. Mm-hmm. And we teach them how to self-massage once we leave. Okay. Well, let's, yeah. let's, let's start at the... I'm slow. Let's start at the beginning. <laughs> so your background, what, what about the whole Kiwi Aussie uh, thing? You told me your, your husband's Australian. And so, I mean, we have rivalries in our country like Michigan, Ohio State, and Duke. I went to Duke and Duke, North Carolina, and you have families that are like house divided, you know, half cheer for Duke and half cheer for UNC. What's, what are the issues that you have in terms of your Kiwi and Aussie uh, very big issues. <laughs> very, very big, big issues. issues. You see, that's why I asked. <laughs> I when the All Blacks are playing, my husband turns it off. <laughs> you know, when they're playing Australia, he turns the TV off. Like, it's it's massive, yeah. It's always like Kiwis against Aussies, yeah. definitely. And what about, is it, is it just rugby or is it other? It's it, food, it's everything. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it is. Do you what guys about? get along? <laughs> well, I'm married to an Australian, so. <laughs> <laughs> S- says that with a slight bit of Kiwi disdain. <laughs> Oh, I like that. So your your background nursing, and then through that, so it's kind of interesting to me that lymphatic massage is something that you can incorporate. I, I don't know if that's the case here. I mean, I I I kind of never heard of that in terms from a nursing. I certainly know people that have gone through and been certified through lymphatic massage, but I don't know if it's part of the nursing program as much maybe as, as it is yeah. where you are. Can I- you just speak a little bit about sort of just really dumb it down, the very basics about lymphatic massage and what it is and how it's performed and, and just really, you know, pretend we don't know anything about it. Sure. So lymphatic massage is more of a softer type of massage and you're, you're working along the lymph vessel line. So it's important for patients to know that lymph vessels are one-way valves. So when we're doing a massage, we are stretching the skin, popping open those valves and drawing that fluid a lot of patients think they can just have a massage that's deep tissue, anything like that. We'll just push down, compress that vessel. Uh, yeah. The fluid doesn't go anywhere. So if anyone comes to me and they say, oh, I had a really hard massage, really deep, it's like, no, you're meant to be stretching the skin, moving that fluid to the, either the open incisions or into the lymph nodes. Okay, so it's a, it's a definitely, it's, it's, we know that. I mean, that's like veins, they're unidirectional. They have valves that open when the fluid is moving in one direction Correct. and then they close back again. Yeah. So when, when you do, let's say, a lymphatic massage after lipo, where do you start? What part of, let's say somebody's had a BBL or they've yeah. had total 360 degree circumferential lipo, wh- where do you start? What part of the body are you starting? Just take me through that, what, sure. what your plan would be. So we always start in opening the terminus, which is a big terminus in the middle of the chest. Then we start towards the abdomen, so working towards either the open incisions or the lymph nodes. And we always try to tell the patients that easy way to remember is anything above the bra line goes into your armpits, anything below the bra line goes into your groin. So when we're massaging the tummy, we sort of do like a triangle version down to that incision so we can get as much fluid out as possible. And then we do a sweeping motion towards the groin. So like that. Um, with the BBLs, we get them to stand up for their massages. Oh, my goodness. Wow, yeah. that's unusual. Yeah. Um, and we do the gravity because our patients have little drains, mm-hmm. um, but you can only do them standing up. Sometimes they kneel, but we prefer to, them to stand. And do you do anything for the legs? Now, they're not part of the lipo, but they uh, they get edematous and they have lymph fluid. Do you treat that at all? Yes, we do. And they a lot of them do have their legs done. 
Um, they have their legs, their arms done. So we do a lot of that massaging. And we also massage elderly people with lymphedema. It's, it improves recovery results by 80%. It's amazing lymphatic massage. Well, uh, I ha- so, and we talked a little bit about this yesterday. Yeah. But um, I'm, fa- I'm, I'm fascinated by lymphatic massage because I think there are a lot of people out there that think it's sort of a, a nonsense bullshit mm-hmm. thing. And those of us, obviously you have a lot more experience from a giving it point of view. Yeah. I have a lot of experience when I did reconstructive plastic surgery and we used to do a lot of lower extremity reconstruction. So if somebody got in a car accident or gunshot or cancer or you know many, many different types of tr- trauma, then as plastic surgeons, we would do flaps. So sometimes we did what's called free flaps Uh, where we would take the latissimus muscle off the back, completely disconnect it, and then sew it into the arteries and the veins and the leg. It was a very long, complicated surgery. Do it under a microscope. These little tiny, you know, sutures, uh, smaller than a hair. And, um, but then the main problem is when when you transplant that tissue is swelling and it's lymphedema. And so we were really proactive with elevation but where I, when I did my training, we didn't have any lymphatic massage people, you know, in the hospital. When I went into private practice and I was doing reconstruction in the hospital, and I got in touch with a patient at the wound care, a uh, person at the wound care center, who did the lymphatic massage, and it completely blew my mind, because I would see people with these huge edematous legs. And we were struggling with like all these solutions, putting wraps and elevating them and, you know, different types of physical therapy. And then this, this one certified lymphatic massage person, she was like, let me work with them. And I, and I was a little bit skeptical, I have to tell you. And it was shocking, the difference. And I really believe that she saved some flaps that were struggling um, and helped with their function, their recovery, their pain, like, you could go on and on and on. Yeah. So, I mean, I think lymphatic massage is so, 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 so important. And I just wonder sort of if people are getting massages after having these procedures, if they're really getting true lymphatic massages or they're getting just massages yeah. or yeah. Big difference. massages. Yeah. Ma- and to my understanding, um, I know you mentioned soft tissue and the mas- your massage, but these aren't very um, enjoyable no. massages, right? <laughs> no. We're, no. Don't let yourself be fooled. Um, we want to properly inform you because from our conversation before, it doesn't you know, seem like these post-operative uh, massage, massages are very um, calm and serene. It's and, not like a stay at the spa. Yeah, it, not very so painful. much. Yeah. Very, I mean, it's <laughs> like being very painful. like your whole body's bruised and someone's just belting into you. Even yeah. though it feels very, it's normally very, very soft. Um, but it's just like being bruised all over and digging. So it's very painful. Sign me up. Yeah. <laughs> but, wow. but the relief that they get. And Afterwards, oh, people say, yeah. do you have that experience? Yeah, because w- when they wake up, they're tight, they're full of fluid. Mm-hmm. And the only relief is the massage. How quickly, Circulation, moving, drinking fluid. How quickly does that relief um, start to set in? Is it almost immediate or immediate. have we expanded the bruising? Immediate, as soon as you release that fluid, they just okay. feel lighter, they feel better, their range of motion is you better. You love your job. <laughs> I but do. It feels good, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm someone, passionate about nursing, yes. definitely. <laughs> Well, listen, if you get on a plane and you fly from oh, Sydney to yeah. Miami, I'm pretty sure you're passionate. Yeah, exactly. No, but I, I, it, it's, 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 I just, I love it. I, this whole concept is absolutely fascinating to me. Yeah, and it's, it's good for a lot of, you know, conditions, you know, respiratory, you know, decongestion. It's amazing massage. It's just the evidence is there. People just need to use it more. Yeah, I yeah. think it's probably very underutilized. Yeah. Um, so let's just stray for one moment from plastic surgery. You mentioned other, um, you know, sort of afflictions that can be helped by lymphatic massage. But what about sort of every day? Do, do you, maybe you don't do this in your practice, but everyday people, like if someone's post-workout or do you think there's a role for lymphatic massage for that? I mean, recovery from working out is now like a huge focus and it's done totally different than it ever used to be done. I mean, 
I know, but I'm Canadian and Gabby loves hockey. We're always talking hockey. <laughs> the the hockey players in the old days, you know, would go for a beer and a cigarette after uh, after playing a hockey game. You know, my oh, favorite. Was that not what we're supposed to do after work? Yeah. <laughs> oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> Your workout <laughs> plan is I not. I may not be doing the right thing. <laughs> that, um, you know, but it, that's obviously totally changed with rollers and compression and Correct. vibrational technology. And we're going to be talking about that on a different podcast. But w what, what are your thoughts in terms of lymphatic massage? Do you see any of that? Is that happening for I athletes? Yeah, I haven't seen a lot of it for athletes just because it's not known. Yeah, that's, that's what all I'm wondering. It is. Yeah. It's, just, it's just not known. But you think it would be something useful? It's always useful for everything. Yeah. You know, what can be wrong with moving that fluid and circulating it through your body? Yeah. So. And the, f the fluid, just to kind of go back, so any that I like that. I've never thought of it in that terms of the lymphatic drainage. I mean, we as surgeons, you know, we used to, as plastic surgeons, we do a lot of breast reconstruction for breast cancer. And when women have cancer, we the breast surgeon always examines the lymph nodes to see if there's any tumor has sort of escaped the breast and move to the armpit because that's where the drainage of the breast is. But I, I've never sort of thought of it the way you do in terms of anything above the bra line is going to your armpit, anything below is going to your groin. Yeah. And that probably explains why there's so many difficulty with healing from lower extremity because everything's trying to get uphill. All that fluid is trying to go up to the groin from the foot and so that, yeah. that probably explains it from a gravitational point of view. Well, a lot of the, what happens with the fluid is it drops. So the woman get very fluidy down the bottom of their abdomen. That's where the seromas can form. Yes. So agitation with that massage roll is where that really works down in here. Because they forget to massage here, like when they're left on their own. Um, and that's when it all pulls down there. Um, their genitals, they need to be educated that their genitals get really swollen. They get really yes. bruised and they get scared. You know, so I'm scared. It's so swelling <laughs> just drops, yeah, and it drops to the feet, so it goes right down to the feet. Yeah, and when you're sitting or you're laying, the most dependent part are your genitals, and so you'll. I mean, I can't tell you the number of phone calls I've had over my career where people are, like you said, afraid, afraid terrified. Yeah. Is this going to go back to normal? It's yeah. like five times the size that it used to be. And, yeah, and yeah, and that just that illustrates the. The fluid. So, yeah. do, do you specifically address that? Is that yeah. an issue? Do you work? Do you have patients that have that problem? And yeah, all the time. So, but we ma what we do is we organise packages for these ladies, and we provide massages, nursing care. So, through our massaging, if we break off for a few days, we will see the difference where they haven't touched down there. So, what we do is we agitate with the roller, mm -hmm. like l little knuckles or little balls, mm -hmm. just to remove that fluid, and then massaging the limbs up towards the groin. Gabby is uh, biting I, I was her just tongue thinking, when you said little balls, we and we're talking back, about the genital watch area. Watch my face, and I, it just it sounds it's a, not a nice recovery. Yeah, no, Gabby and I can doesn't. degenerate into 12 year old boys very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> we were we were grass. You don't set us up with words like yeah, that, Gabby. No, 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 we had to reel it in very quickly. Um, but I was also actually also curious about um, your recovery home as far as, you know, kind of what does the um, timing look like mm -hmm. post op? You know, how long do, is on average as a patient? patient there um I know you mentioned just how quickly um within the first day you know those two showers to them showering themselves which we've talked about how important yeah. touch therapy mm -hmm. can be yeah, so I guess definitely. kind of how long is that healing process or how long is a patient typically in your uh, recovery home yeah uh, so basically we do around a 10 day mark mm -hmm. and that's when their drains come out and that's mm -hmm. when they should be able to do things themselves um, even their range of motion should start straight away so we give them stretches we give them everything um, the recovery home, yeah, provides 24-hour nursing services. Um, so straight after post-op, we pick them up, straight into the home, 10 days, 24-hour nursing care, food by a qualified chef for their nutrition, good fats to keep that fat. Um, Do you need surgery to go into this home for a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> can, we just, can I just make a reservation? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's really exciting to have the first time and it's needed because people want to share experiences with each other and mm -hmm. it helps them recover. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I'm also wondering too, um, I know you said, or you mentioned that the drains are a different size and how do the lymphatic massages affect, I guess, the level of leaking? We've talked about yeah. that there's a lot to be expected. Does the massage 
um, lesson or how yep. does the leaking play into that? Yeah, so they have three drains, so two in the lower abdo and one in the belly button. And I believe that the drains do give you more fluid extraction mm -hmm. through those massages. So we always go towards a drain into the triangle motion and we get quite a lot of fluid out um, and they come out on the day 10. So that's when we, we're just trying to get as much out of those drains as possible during that time and out of the incisions while they're closed. Mm -hmm. Are they getting daily uh, lymphatic massages during those 10 days? Only if they book with us. Uh, only if they book a package with us. The clinic does not provide it. Like the, the surgeon's but clinic. But in a recovery home? Oh yes, okay, daily so massaging. If, if they're staying with you daily? Yes. And Gabby brought up touch, and that's, um, I'm, I'm curious to know your yeah. thoughts about, because, you know, obviously after breast surgery, there's, you can have really sensitive, you know, nipple areolas, and you, you can have, uh, you know, un, un, untoward sensations. And so yeah. I always encourage patients, patients to touch, but you're an expert. Yeah. What, what are your sort of thoughts about that? So, yeah, definitely touch. So when they take the garment off and part-time, full-time, and when they put their clothes on for the first time, they all tell me that the feeling is horrible. Like mm -hmm. they, it feels prickly on them. It feels yeah. like it's not their skin. So early on, you get them to self-massage, touch their body, get it back to that normal feeling. I'm totally for that touch. Yeah, it's the only way to regenerate the nerves quicker, make them you know rejoin back to their body quicker to be honest yeah, yeah. to behave yeah I, I think when nerves get disrupted they they get angry and and they just send out these aberrant signals that are that your body doesn't know what to do with them and yeah. interprets them as pain yeah that's so right. touch do you use any devices or any any other techniques uh, we use that. little tiny little massage rollers that we give the patients to just do themselves inside, uh, like on top of their garments. So because we don't want them out of their garment too long because we don't want that fluid building back up. So we just use little rollers that can agitate any hard areas and they can just constantly do that all day. And that's good for touch and it's good yeah. for lymphatic and it's good Nerves, for... everything. Yeah. yeah. So these are just little tiny handheld... Yep. Little rollers. tiny handheld rollers, and they can do their chin, everything, arms. Candy, really I think good. you figured this whole thing out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, well, we talk about, you know, I've been talking about these things for years, but you, it's like you've organized and put everything together, and you're educated, knowledgeable, and like I said, I mean, I think this is a model. You've you've given me some documents that are are thorough and complete and I, I love how it's so well and we're going to look and incorporate some of these into our practice because it Pretty seems wonderful. like yeah you've just worked everything out it's almost like you're a like a soldier you yeah know, Kenny like what a, is it like being a perfect goddess yeah, <laughs> like, how, does, like how, how do you just like exist amongst the rest of us <laughs> regular yeah. people yeah, like, I like, just all about my patients yeah. you know and that's what it's about just want to help them recover better yeah and, yeah and so, so they stay with you for 10 days. Yep. I just want to kind of get your protocol. Yeah. So 10 days, you're doing the lymphatics every day. They're wearing the compression garments. They're doing their own rollers, their touches. They're, you know, starting to become more self-sufficient, which I think is an important point because they have, you know, nobody, number one, will care for you like you care for yourself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, back in the day when we had patients taking care of their wounds or we still have troubles with with wounds sometimes after tummy tucks or the um, breast reductions for example these triple point healing problems and I've always been a bit big advocate of you know we'll we'll do this for you for two or three times but you have to be the one to be able to do it that's how you're going to get the best care that's Correct. how the wound is going to get the best treatment so you're teaching them all to be self-sufficient and then at 10 days, is that sort of the end of your connection with them? You kick them to the curb or what? what <laughs> Not at all. And that is luck. Nice that, knowing you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd love to know because it's a long process, right? It is a long process. So what's and the next sort of step? Um, well, first of all, they go through quite a lot of depression. So the first, probably day five is their worst day. So it's a real emotional journey. So we go on a real journey with these girls. Um, and we like to s keep the same nurses with the same girls. So 
you go in there, you look after these people, you get their numbers, you contact them after they leave. We contact them six weeks post-op and we're always in contact. We're like friends, you know, and we're people that will just do anything for you. We'll tailor anything to your needs. If you need us to come and babysit your child because you're still unwell, we'll come and do that. You know, it's, so just little things like that to help. <laughs> Is this place real? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> what? We the, transport the children if they need transport. Oh you know, we take you to an appointment if you need that. It's do you need shopping? It's everything they need basically. And wow. then the PT <laughs> sessions we've incorporated. Um, so oh, um, tell us about that. Yeah. yeah. So, physical therapy. Uh, yeah, physio, this uh, is amazing. Sorry, this is personal a, trainer. Oh, personal trainer. Personal trainer. So okay. they come in um, day three and they start teaching them how to do the stretches to open up all the areas that they've had the lipo on. Um, and then they do an assessment and plan for them to go on and keep those results. Wow. And a good eating and nutrition plan as well. Wow. So we've got well, exercises yeah, I mean, I to keep I am speechless. I mean, especially the whole, I'm uh, a big mental health advocate um, that has something that I've lived with and I can't imagine going through um, this kind of physical trauma and just the expectations and even what I've learned in this and these very painful non-resort like lymphatic massages to leaking and everything else the fact that you guys offer that support is so incredible yeah. and so amazing and I imagine um, I think that's something we should probably circle back and touch on too it's just the whole mental that. health yes, aspect to this for these women and already what you're putting your bodies through and you know the expectations you have you know in your mind and in your eyes in the mirror and stuff and that's that whole right. Process yeah. like I had no idea, you know, before this podcast, I had no idea all of these things, and I think it's so important to um, yeah. let everyone know. Obviously, that's what we're here to do. Yeah, I mean, it's just being prepared. So, t tell us about that because it's so my own personal experience with patients recovering is you know, I'm not as connected to them post operatively as a surgeon. We operate and we make sure there are no problems that's a the the main thing post-operatively as a surgeon we're always looking for yeah. is not really a result we, we've done everything we can do we're not the, there's nothing we can do at that point from a result but we're looking for a complication we have to find a complication identify and treat it that's that's your main sort of task but then along the way when you're doing that obviously you're interacting with patients you're getting their feedback and i've always found that for patients that have a really good like early couple of days I, I would always caution them, you know, you're probably going to crash. And if you crash, don't panic because it doesn't mean something's wrong. This is really kind of normal. Part of the and process. Yeah. yeah. So to, but you so you've kind of I've always thought it was day three, but you're but you know a lot more and you have a lot more experience yeah. with it. And you so tell us about this whole day five and the emotional yep. things and what you do but this is fascinating yeah so day three is also very emotional because of the swelling mm -hmm. um and they're seeing themselves bigger than Candy, they i'm going to interrupt you i'm so sorry my head is like a dirt storm i have so many questions for you it's i'm i'm like you're, you're just so amazing to me I'm buckle just, up yeah <laughs> well it, you just because i want to interrupt you because you said day three because of the swelling and and i and i just really want to emphasize that point because that's i, I think people don't understand that swelling the peak swelling happens at day three and it's why patients have heart attacks after not after what we're doing but after other types of surgery because you start to mobilize that fluid in your body by yourself and it starts getting into your heart and your your uh, vascular system and it's more work for your heart so if you're you know elderly and you've had uh, heart surgery and things like that like day three, they've already started to turn the fluids off. They get diuretics. They're anticipating that, you know, bolus of fluid that's coming. So that's a different, you know, I've experienced that when I was in general surgery and looking after patients and things. You really have to pay attention to that fluid curve. Um, so, yeah, so tell us about that. So day three, day three. maximal swelling, that happens to every single person. Yeah, and yeah. they're just like, what is going on? Like, I've yeah. just had surgery and I'm meant to look smaller. Yes. You know? So it's about educating them on the process. Trust the process. Like, it's education. Um, day four, five, they're starting to get sleep deprived. They're starting to cry, emotions, because they just look at themselves and they think, what have I done? they regret the surgery. They actually go through quite a bit of depression through that first oh. week. 
And then they start trying clothes on and they think, okay, these clothes don't fit me, even though it may have a butt, but they still don't fit. Mm -hmm. And they think, uh, then they throw away all their clothes. So they get depressed on that as well Mm -hmm. because they've brought all these new clothes for their new procedure Mm -hmm. and they don't fit them in the right areas, but they they look different. But their clothes, they need to go bigger. It's, Mm -hmm. It's a strange sort of process yeah Yeah. so it's like they look different but their clothes are a bit bigger Mm -hmm. but then smaller in one area it's it's very um concerning to them at that stage well it's a very confusing journey yeah yeah and then the pain the pain is starting to set in so with um our garments and our we wear a binder and a board and that just compresses them so much and a lot of the pain starts setting in day five sleeping on their tummy sore lower back sore neck and what can they do? They can only put their neck left and right. That's it. So we, you encourage them to get up and move when they're feeling stiff. Move that fluid. Mm-hmm. You, you give a lot of tough love, I think. You have to because they're so vulnerable. You just have to. Um, you have to be very kind. Um, they're you know fully naked in front of you, mm-hmm. so you, it's dignity. They're vulnerable. Yeah. yeah, and it's you know just making them feel comfortable. Because a lot of the times they'll go to external massage therapists and they come out crying and just a horrible experience for them. So um, that's a difference with us. We just give a bit more quality care. Well, I would say more. Sounds than, like it. Yeah, yeah. More, I'm convinced. Yeah. yeah. More, more than a bit more. But it, yeah. it, it, this is really kind of the, it seems like we've uh, stumbled upon the future of yeah. post-operative care yeah. where all of these things that we kind of, acknowledge and see but we're not really completely dealing with mm-hmm. all of these things like you are i mean the, the the mental health do you have any specific counselors or you don't really need that because you guys are the ones that are there that's touching right. the patient we're the nurses we're counselors we're everything to them we can do everything for them so we support them it's it's a tough you're 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 a real old school nursing you're not charting on the computer no. while the patient's uh, over there and you're in the corner. I don't know if anyone's had that experience, <laughs> yeah. but I mean, it's kind of like our technology has really changed. The relationship what, yeah. between the caregiver and yeah. yes. the patient. Nothing I'm, can compare to the, a person and yeah. their hands. And yeah. the hands, the yeah. touch. The touch, mm-hmm. a the human physical touch. physical touch. The caring part of caregiving. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The actual care. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's absolutely beautiful. I love, I love that. I think that needs to spread. Just not even post op. Just I think throughout our healthcare system, yeah. um, especially too with post op. I think um, for people like me, so naive or just so like something that I didn't really explore before. You think post op, you just think result. You think yes. the final, the before and after. You don't even consider all of the things to get to that point. So this has been incredibly eye opening, as every episode has been. But especially to go into depth like this, I think um, other women who are thinking about doing this or women who've gone through this, it's very validating, I'm sure, because this is an honest part of the experience. Um, well, I, I can't imagine anybody going through this and and it's, not it's hard. and well and not being just grateful and thankful. You must have like a an incredible bond I do. Uh, that forms with these patients, and then their friends come and do you ever exactly. are you overwhelmed? I mean, I I kind of would imagine you'd be not have enough room or enough. Well, that's why I have to go home <laughs> on Saturday. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, when is time for yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's why I have to go home on Saturday. But, yeah, it's um, it's crazy, but it's it's needed. And with the um, stretching, the, the the personal training then, tell, tell us a little bit about that. That's interesting. Is, is that s- to preserve the kind of open lymphatic channels. Did I interpret that correctly? Correctly. So we just want to keep that open. We would just want to stretch open those areas, especially down in here. This is where they really build up. Um, and the legs, just keeping those areas soft and stretching them because they just get so tight. And stretching is really important to get their range of motion back really quickly. So these are different types of stretches? They're stretches specifically designed for liposuction and BBL. How long does it take to do uh, stretching? I think they're like four types of stretches, two times a day, 15 reps. 
Okay. Yeah. So it's not a, a huge time commitment. No. And then when you go post-op six weeks, you then move on to the more strenuous exercises to keep your results if you've had a BBL or lipo into the abdo area. Do you have a plan for that? I you, do. You do as yeah. well. Yeah. So is that something that the patients then can just follow? Correct. They don't have to have any instructions. So um, the personal trainer goes over there with the photos and the pamphlet with all the stretches, and he shows them how to stretch appropriately because a lot of people think they can stretch and do the exercises, but they're not using the right areas when they're moving those muscles. So you need to activate those right areas to get in there. So he shows them the proper way. Um, and then he will go on to get their goals and he'll do up a plan for them to go home with. Uh, I have two things. I told you I've got a dirt storm in my <laughs> head right now. I'm just, it's like I've had you know 18 cups of coffee. Um, so you mentioned that patients have a lot of pain in this lateral area, and that's certainly been my experience. And also in the lower lateral area in the flanks, I owe, in, in, in that area, sometimes patients will come back at, I don't know, let's say two or three weeks, and they have very, very firm tissue there. I call them like the rocks. I'll even say to a patient, it looks like, um, it feels like those little spa rocks, which is different than these types of massages. Like yeah, no, no. But you know those little hot stone <laughs> massages? None of these yes. things sound like a spa that I would so, <laughs> want to get a massage from. But, but to me in keep my, trying to sell it to me. <laughs> in my mind, I kind of picture that there's a little bit of one of those smooth, oval, flatter rocks in there. And in my mind, that's like scar tissue that's not really fully developed, but it's, it's indurated fat, basically, yeah. you know. And so... Do you experience, do you, you have patients, you're nodding your head, so yeah. So do you yeah. treat those specifically or differently or just tell me about those areas? And I'm fascinated now because you told me that, you know, I've ex seen patients with this lateral pain here by their chest. I've always thought it was just because it's near the ribs and the ribs can be painful. But it sounds like maybe this is a kind of no man's land for lymphatic drainage, maybe a poorer drainage, uh, weaker lymph drainage area. And maybe that's why the fu fluid is accumulating there. Yeah, and it's just because they're not moving it as well. It or needs the constant movement. Yeah, the stretching, constant movement. So what do you do with those little rocks that you are down there? You have to really get in there with rollers. That's when you start using spiky rollers and really breaking it up, but it has to be done continuously so to our keep mornings, going. So are really, really rough for patients after, you know, being Spiky so rollers sound, sound painful, though. Yeah, like the little ball ones, just to break, even knuckles. Knuckles are good. Just mm -hmm. breaking it up. a lot of this sounds painful. Yeah, just breaking it up. It's really, but you can definitely soften it if you get it in time. Well, that's my next question. So I would imagine with your type of post-operative care that you would have a very low fibrosis rate. Very low. It I've has, never seen it. I mean, that's that's really fascinating. I've seen two ceramas that we didn't perform massages for and they came to us. Um, and I've seen two types of cellulitis and that is it. Yeah, cellulitis yeah. we don't see too much, no, which is kind of surprising, I, I would think, because we're dealing with all these sort of fresh edges, which would be portals for bacteria to enter. But yeah. um, so if you're doing this very low, low seroma rates, because you're, you're already getting it. Moving that fluid. Ex move. Yeah. So that fluid that's down there, and, and what you mentioned earlier with the seromas forming in the lower abdomen, that's, yeah. you know, that's where they form because of the dependence of the gravity, so the fluid is going there. Um, and so you're working that fluid towards the groin lymph, lymph nodes. Correct, always working towards the groin lymph nodes, P trying to push it in, agitating it back and forward, and then pushing it into the groin. How long does your the lymphatic massages take, would you say? Is it an hour type thing? When, or? Uh, when we do the shower and garment change, that's when we normally massage while the garment's been washed and dried. Mm -hmm. um, but if they come to us for a separate one or they're in the home, it's an hour, just under an hour so that we can get that garment back on. That's a long time to hold my breath. <laughs> I don't know if I'd survive it. <laughs> I think now is actually a good moment to pause and go into our bit of the episode. Um, do you know what time it is, Doc? Oh, no. What time is it? Uh, what's up, Doc? What's time for, 
What's up, Doc? But we're going to do what's up, Doc and Nurse today since you're joining us, Candy. Okay. So basically, I'm going to ask you guys a question, kind of bring up a topic here in the plastic surgeon surgery industry, and then you guys give me your hot take on that. So what uh, we're going to talk about the benefits of massage rollers after liposuction, which I know we started to go into. Um, so basically, do they work? Why are they important? And obviously, I know there are so many different types and shapes and things, you know, which ones are the good ones and which ones are the not so helpful ones. Yeah, well, rollers are really good at the stage where they start getting, just before they start getting firm. Um, so when's oh. that? What, at what point? I reckon in that first week, so I reckon after day five, start using a roller. Gentle, Candy, I would gentle. not be surprised if you got it down to the exact minute. <laughs> yeah. Phase of she the moon. <laughs> exactly. Experience. You are all knowing. I oh. trust anything you say. <laughs> <laughs> um, and especially the back area, because when the, the swelling, or well, the fluid drops down to the back to the sacral area and it just sits like a mm -hmm. hard band. So rollers are really good for that. They can just put it on the wall, stand there and just go up and down if they've had the BBL. So it's oh, you're talking about like a like a foam roller type yeah, thing? Yeah, any sort of roller. What, what is it? Like more of a spiky roller would be better. Okay. So you can really break it up. You need to really break up those areas. And your spirit. Yeah. Just break up your spirit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, we're working on a roller um, that, that hopefully will be out soon. Yeah. Um, because that's what I've seen too over the time is that the rolling devices. I didn't really know the timing um, unt until you said so. I had recommended patients roll early, but you think that just not at that point. Start a little bit later. <laughs> way too tender. Way just too, too hard. Then yeah. they're, then they're going to lose interest. They're not going to do it. It's yeah. They're just uh, dealing okay. with those massages right now, which is painful enough. So as long as we're trying to keep those areas soft as we can go. Um, then we can avoid it as long as possible. And how long do you recommend rolling? Until you can have no hard bits, because you can be hard for quite a while, like, you know, six months. You can still be massaging hard bits to get soft. So just continue for continue. that length of time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's consistent with, with our knowledge in terms of how the body heals yeah. and how long it takes to get rid of inflammation and, and edema and everything else. Yeah. Yeah, it's very important, the massaging post-op. Yeah, no, it's absolutely uh, critical. But I, I, I think today one of, the, I mean, I've learned so much from you. Um, but the, the, the having your massages done by the in the correct way is absolutely. Are there lymphatic conferences? Do you go to lymphatic conferences, or do you host any training or or things like that? I mean, I, I would think it would be. If I was in your field here in the United States, I, my first thing would be like, how do I get a hold of you and can I come and just... Start the club. Yeah, yeah <laughs> witness what you do. He wants to join. Well, once, the, once our nurses are certified in it, I go out and train them. They have about five hours on-site training with our patients. That's about all I do with the training <coughs> at the moment. Yeah, yeah, well, they've had their training to already. Their, and their nurses as well. Yeah. So, yeah. And so what, to give us an idea of sort of the scale of your recovery uh, facility and, and do you have more than one location or you're opening another location, is that? So we're in Sydney and we're hoping to open in the Gold Coast and Melbourne. Um, and we've got around 20 registered nurses and around about 10 carers. Okay, yeah. that's a big, that's a yeah. big group. Yeah. <coughs> <clears throat> and our recovery home, you're 24 hours, so we have two nurses that will do eight to eight. And the massage is all done during the day? Yeah. So they'll oh. do the showers, the massaging, they'll have their PT come over, they'll have the chef come and do their meals. And then what are people doing in the evening? I mean, they're... Go, uh, we inc we t encourage them to walk, yeah. do the 30 minutes, always. Um, and they just join each other. They go and walk to dinner because where the home is is near a... a great shopping centre so they're able to go and shop oh, wow. especially after their recovery and it's like H&M all those stores mm -hmm. so they can all and they love it Some and it keeps in mind therapy yeah, yeah and it buffers <laughs> absolutely it buffers. I'm all for that exactly <laughs> And it buffers the pain, you know. For sure, yeah. yeah. Spending money would. Yeah. Buying things, absolutely. Things are forever. And so. it, it, I'm just wondering, because 10 days is a big commitment, but it seems like it's totally necessary. Yeah. yeah. 10 days um, is minimum, I believe, care should so. be given. Yeah. yeah. 
and it, it really makes sense. And and I think sometimes people try to have their surgery and fit it into a very tight window for work or school or whatever other yeah. obligations but yeah. allow, the, allow yourself the time to fully yeah. heal and recover because you will need the strength if there's anything you could take away from this is yeah. patience and trusting the process yeah. and making sure you educate yourself on the recovery <clears throat> and right. allow your finances for your massages and your aftercare is really important yeah that, i've never thought about that but yeah. that's obviously something that's that's important because yeah. it's not just the uh, cost of the surgery and and going through that but everything else mm -hmm. i mean sometimes we um patients pay us more money than the surgery to care for them and then they, yeah. yeah well that makes yeah. sense if you're looking at 10 days and intensive therapy of, with with a lot of staff and hands-on yeah. and stretching and nutrition and diet and yeah. all the rolling and massages and if they have someone at home we can come into the home and help them but they don't have to have that 24-hour service so we can tailor it more to their needs and so in that situation you're doing what focusing on the lymphatic massages showers the showers the stretching uh, the, the transportation mm -hmm. cleaning yeah. do you clean the wounds and garments yeah. as well yeah you mentioned you put betadine on all the wounds yep so all that's the different than, than oh, okay. what we do what I do don't you use nothing oh okay yeah we clean every incision with betadine so you do soap and water first no soap just water under the shower though so they have a shower okay and then when they're out of the shower we clean all their incisions and drains with betadine and then assist them back into the garment and you leave that uh, betadine on there yes you kind of just paint it over yeah yeah well we we've used that um we use it more of a for desiccation so for wounds that are kind of macerated or something yeah um, we used that in the past well that's interesting yeah so that's just a stop, different yeah, another you know way to stop infection mm -hmm. now and candy for um our listeners who can't make it all the way to Australia to your yeah, gorgeous say, facility. You could, you could what? <laughs> yeah. to for Sydney. those of everyone who <laughs> and myself who are not blessed to be there, um, what do you recommend for um, like at home care or you know what patients should maybe seek out or certain things they should look for in care facilities post op that you think would be really helpful and beneficial or that they could maybe just do on their own from yeah home. so they definitely need somebody for that first night mm -hmm. that first night is really important and that person needs to make sure they get up and mobilize yeah. just to prevent dvts um yeah it's just crazy the recovery and especially the showering so they need someone with them when they're showering because their mm -hmm. blood pressure is low for around three days post-op mm -hmm. and when you take that garment off for the first time it is horrible for them and because of that dead space that's yeah, left they get light -headed. Um, yeah lightheaded and they feel like they're falling out of their skin they feel like <laughs> it's not their body it's very scary for them so having someone there is really important do they you have people faint yeah Absolutely. I'm about to, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. people us, faint. I, this sounds, okay, yeah, somebody with you, lots yeah. of handlebars, yeah. tough no, love, got it. <laughs> no um, steam in the shower. It only can be lukewarm, so no steam at all. Okay. Um, yeah, just making sure someone is there for that first night. Um, you've got someone there for all your showers, and but they've got to not rely on them too much because I see a lot of people that have that help from their loved ones, mm -hmm. and they're like, Mum, get me this. Do yes. this. And it's like, don't be an enabler. Yeah. They're just yes. stuck in bed and not yeah. moving. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. So that's what we don't want. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we try and get them back to normal functions yes. as the soon over as possible. The overprotective spouse or the overprotective mother yeah. are not mm -hmm. the right people that's to right. be giving the care because, I mean, to mention it early, and I mean, Gabby's uh, picked up on it. I mean, tough love, but. Yeah. Even if you look back at uh, things that happened in the hospital, I mean, getting patients up and moving them, even though they're uncomfortable, is the right thing to do exactly. for safety. Yeah. And having those patients do more for themselves the sooner uh, is better. Even after, like, for example, breast augmentation, uh, a lot of times I'll see patients come in and they're just completely rigid, you know and i'm like you can move your arms i want you to move your yeah. arms you know because they can develop like a frozen shoulder the yeah. adhesive capsulitis and and things like that and and that's sort of the mother will be putting their shirt on and doing all this mm. type of stuff and we're sort of like let her do that that's right. because we want to transition her and that mm -hmm. will help and speed the recovery anyway exactly i think that's a super important point what yeah. else is there something else you want to tell us candy i, f I feel like we're just 
scratching the surface. But, but, We're so fascinated. But I don't want to keep you here all day. Yeah. But is there anything else you want to talk about or we didn't really touch on or we didn't mention or an important point that you want to bring up? I mean, you're kind of our superhero. Oh, yeah. Really I just think um, patient safety is number one. Um, and that's what everyone needs to look at, like not just over here but even Australia and making sure your patients are safe and that continuity of care. Um, yeah, and I think it's just, you know. About but you've designed something with that in mind, right? Yes. A, a, a special, tell us about that, a special chart, a nursing chart for post-operative care that can kind of pick out areas of concern sure. for safe. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. So we went on to design a discharge procedure for hospitals and day procedures because there's been a lot of attention in the media with post-operative care. People being sent home getting really sick or getting very ill from their mm -hmm. surgery. Um, so we went and advocated and designed a discharge procedure that um, you know promotes that patient safety. That they're able to be, they have to be picked up from the surgery. They have to have that first night overnight care and they have to sign a consent form so the surgeon sees that they have a carer to take mm -hmm. them home. Mm -hmm. it's, it's about patient safety and mm -hmm. that's what we're trying to advocate. I mean, to, to, for my way of thinking, I mean, not having a good caregiver seems to be completely just insane that, yeah. that, would, that would happen. But it does happen, and we've seen it happen. It sounds like you've seen it happen as well. So you go through a very specific consent form checklist and to ensure that everything is done correctly. Correct. I think that's, Correct. that's something that, that we should incorporate, yeah. too, into our... Plan. I mean, we do that on a much more, not as a uh, checklist consent type of thing that you do, yeah. but we do it more just, you know, mm -hmm. making sure that patients have yeah. caregivers and things and things like that. Yeah, well, it's a really good procedure to follow just to make sure everything's in place and that everyone's getting the best care possible. Let me ask you one final question. And then I have one final question. And that is, so if someone's in your recovery house and they're staying there 10 days and you're doing all of the amazing things that you're doing, recognizing their emotional status and everything else, do do they have uh, friends or family visit? Is that, or, or is it just not allowed in your facility? No, they're quite welcome to have anybody come and visit as long as it's not during a personal care time. Okay. Because you've got the other ladies. Because we only have three people in that home. That's all we have. So yeah. it's three people at the one time because we just don't want that mm -hmm. over patient to nurse ratio. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, they're quite welcome to do all that as long as it's not during that personal care time. It seems like your facility could and should handle more people just based on the amount. But We've had a lot of interest in it, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's just people want six weeks and it's like I, then I have to match two other people for six weeks. So yeah. it's, mm. it's a bit difficult that way. Six weeks, yeah. That's what Gabby and I are thinking about. <laughs> six weeks. It's a nice time for a getaway, yeah. I, I don't want the spiky roller, though. No, no, you can hold the roller, you can hold the lymphatic yeah. massages, you can hold the leakage, the drainage, the pain. I'll take all of the fun stuff. The chef, great. Yeah. <laughs> but it's about them experiencing this together, and it helps them not think about the pain. It buffers the True. pain. They can go for walks together. That's nice. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Get those massages. Yeah. You know? yeah. No, that's great. My question is, in regards regards to recovery garments, what you use, and um, have you heard of the OG Faha? I certainly have. That is what has brought me here today. Oh, how funny. <laughs> have you um, gotten to experience the Faha, touch it, feel it, and what is your opinion? Well, I put it on yesterday and thought I had a Brazilian butt lift. Oh, so okay. It's I, a good shapewear wow, yeah. garment. Yeah. And the compression in the abdominal area mm -hmm. is unbelievable. Um, and the buttock, how it supports it, because our garments don't have any support under the bottom, which I think brings back a lot of BBL touch-ups because mm -hmm. it's just dropping mm -hmm. and they need to touch up more in the same areas. Um, and yeah, and it takes away our board, which we use. Mm -hmm. We use a binder, which kills the patients. It's mm -hmm. so painful. Um, and the OG Faha actually compresses in those areas where we use those other devices. So it's just like... So you think you wouldn't even use any other no. devices with the yeah. OG? Yeah, because you're, you're compressing the sacral, you're, you're holding the butt, um, and you're compressing the abdo with really good compression. Mm -hmm. 
So you don't need that binder. Yeah, that, I mean it, that power now is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. It's ama- and and the fact that the leak it draws away the fluid. I really mm-hmm. like that because leaking's a big problem for these girls. So that's amazing. Is the OG Faha candy approved? It's candy approved. Oh, I love that. It's candy approved. It's candy it approved. It is. Trust the process. It's get beautiful. your OG Faha. And, and, I, and get that candy carries advice. a lot of weight. I mean, that's I appreciate you saying that, honestly. I oh, mean, it's gorgeous. I have a tremendous amount of respect for you do and for you and what you do. It's, it's really, it's spectacular. Oh. Yeah, it I'm a big fan, Candy. Yes, I'm a big fan, too. My candy If girl. it wasn't so far away, well, we'll still invite you to come on again because yeah. I really do think there's so many other things that we could talk about. And it would be really fun, maybe, to do some international uh, podcast there <laughs> in Australia. Let me know oh, what time the plane good. leaves. I will but be I really would, my bag. I would love to visit and see your facility and see what you do okay. because I think, I think that yeah, me too. is something that yeah. could be mimicked. <laughs> here and absolutely yeah and it could complement your surgery absolutely. yeah yeah well that's the other thing that we've really learned is all of these things fit together that's right it's just it's putting a, them together it's almost like the surgery is a small little tiny mm-hmm. part of it i mean yeah. it's two hours and then it's all the other stuff that goes into it being prepared mm-hmm. and then everything knowing what to expect, and yeah. knowing what to expect and then knowing all the things to use and to do afterwards to preserve your results and, and executing those things yes. well candy before you leave we have a fun little treat it's my favorite part of every episode guys it's time for the og wheel here she comes making her entrance now dr william i did realize um i don't have my good hand to spin the wheel oh no um guys i did break my wrist full transparency because i'm choosing to live my truth here after the song so it's not it's not the uh, shower it wasn't the shower um no it was actually a classic case of family and sibling dispute as i'm sure we all can relate to right we get along with our family no we do i love my sister shout out darcy hi um but we did get into a big big argument and i took it out on the wall next to me and if you are wondering the wall is perfectly fine don't even worry it looks untouched so me and this brace are together for a little bit um but i think i can maybe still give the wheel a go Uh, let's give it a shot if you can i'll help you out okay thank you here we go um candy get ready okay let's see what we got Okay, we still got it done. Oh, a $250 oh, that's giveaway. Fantastic. That's so fun. No. Well, guys, get excited because we've got money for you. Oh, that's great. I prefer that to TikTok, I'll tell you what. No, I do. I, I'm honestly hoping we get TikTok again soon. I'm really excited <laughs> for TikTok. All right, now for How our, work? our $250 giveaway, we need you to like subscribe to the podcast you can find us on apple on spotify on youtube am i forgetting anywhere i don't know all of the all of the above go on there leave a comment and if you have any question guys anything you want us to circle back to or that you don't know let us know because we want to answer we want to talk to you we want to learn and teach you so like comment subscribe and then we will pick a winner and that winner could be well important for this so if there are any questions leave leave a comment Mm -hmm. and i we can get in touch with you i'm absolutely right now i don't want to end the podcast because i'm thinking that there's so many things that we haven't talked about and discussed and i know somebody's out there listening and i'm like why didn't you ask her this yeah but if you do have a question leave it in the com leave Mm -hmm. it in the comments below and then we'll get in touch with Candy and we'll get the, the answer. We're going to stay in touch with you. This has been fantastic. Yeah. It's just absolutely me. wonderful. I've enjoyed it so much. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Yes, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, hang out with us. Join us on our next episode of Behind the Mask. Candy, Dr. William, it has been a pleasure. It has been an honor. Candy, thank you for gracing us with your energy and your beauty and everything pleasure. today. Um, and thank you guys for listening. And Until next time, thank you for listening to Behind the Mask. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Candy. Thanks, Gabby. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. That was wonderful. That was. That was so fun. Candy, you're amazing. You're When you meet somebody who's passionate like she is, it's it's infectious. You mean? podcast.